Welcome to worship this fifth Sunday in Lent at University Evangelical Lutheran Church in Gainesville, Florida on this the 21st of March. As we continue this Lenten journey, let's quieten our hearts as we prepare for worship today. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the keeper of the covenant, the source of steadfast love, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. when we cry and draws us close in Jesus Christ. Let us return to the one who is full 
of compassion. Let us pray. Fountain of living water, pour out your mercy over us. Our sin is heavy and we long to be free. Rebuild what we have ruined and mend what we have torn. Wash us in your cleansing flood. Make us alive in the spirit to follow in the way of Jesus. As healers and restorers of the world you so love. Amen. Beloved, God's word never fails. The promise rests on grace. By the saving love of Jesus Christ, the wisdom and power of God, your sins are forgiven. And God remembers them no more. Journey in the way of Jesus. Amen. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you always, and also with you. Share a sign of that peace with those around you, or send a message electronically to those you can reach right now. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy on us. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. house and for all who offer here their worship and praise. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy on us. Help, save, comfort and defend us, gracious Lord. Let us pray. O oh God, with steadfast love you draw us to yourself, and in mercy you receive our prayers. Strengthen us to bring forth the fruits of the Spirit, that through life and death we may live in your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us read Psalm 51 together. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. In your great compassion, blot out my offenses. Wash me through and through from my wickedness and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my offenses and my sin is ever before me. Against you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are justified when you speak and write in your judgment. Indeed, I was born steeped in wickedness, a sinner from my mother's womb. Indeed, you delight in truth deep within me and would have me know wisdom deep within. Remove my sins with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be purer than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness that the body you have broken may rejoice. 
Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my wickedness. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain me with your bountiful spirit. according to John, the third chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew, then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Some of our friends from the colder regions of the north, like Minnesota, refer to the show A Prairie Home Companion as common knowledge that everyone should have heard about. Okay, some of us in the south, some of you in the south are saying, we also like that show and we also know and are fans of Garrison Keeler, the host of that show. Now, so I'm not trying to be regional, but I'm showing that there are some things in different places that we take for granted and consider to be common knowledge. Western culture is not homogenous, as we all know, yet there are recurrent themes like religion that Western cultures take as common knowledge. We refer to church, biblical history, and texts from the Bible as common knowledge, just as our cousins from the northern states refer to that, that show. Sorry, I'm not a fan, even though there are so many Lutheran references in it. Just didn't catch on. So the common knowledge assumptions about the Bible are heard not only in that show, but from public figures even in non-religious settings like politics. For example, ex-president Donald Trump said that his text that he lives by from the Bible is an eye for an eye. He actually said that. Former President Barack Obama is quoted as saying, take the log from your own eye before pointing out the moat or speck 
in another's eye. He said that even without saying he was quoting the Bible, common knowledge, as I said. Well, finally, Hillary Clinton, as she was campaigning at that time, said that she lives by the attitude in her life and politics, the saying, do unto others as you would have them do to you. No reference, but an expectation that it's common knowledge. Now, granted that Christian themes and quotes don't always point people to Jesus Christ or the Christian faith as such, but more to just religion. Yet, we do live in a milieu that is relatively friendly to the gospel, right? That might not be for much longer. Given the decline in church membership and church attendance and the growing popularity of secularism or what I call religious combo meals. A little bit of everything as a combo for a bargain. So we need more than Christian heritage or culture. We need more than political references or media anecdotes, often by comedians or those who accept Grammys or athletes who give thanks to Jesus when they win. We need to have an intentional approach to introducing people to Jesus. Let's start. Let's start with what happened in the text. Some Greeks wanted to meet and talk to Jesus. The word was out that there was this great teacher and leader whose name was on everyone's lips or tongue, so to speak. These Greeks were drawn to Jesus too. And they seemed to even have an interest in perhaps following him. The problem, if you will, was that Jesus was a Jew, heralded as King of the Jews by people like King Herod and his wise advisors. So these Greeks thought, well, this might be difficult. Let's see who among the disciples we may have some commonality with so that we can approach them. It turned out that that commonality was with Philip. Philip was amongst those Jews whose parents gave them Greek names. History shows us that it is not uncommon that indigenous peoples give their children the names of their conquerors, just so that maybe they may get ahead. It's not always true that they get ahead, but parents are sometimes desperate to try. So these Greek seekers of truth, seekers of Jesus, came to Philip saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. I think it's interesting that instead of going straight to Jesus, Philip first went to Andrew, saying, perhaps, Andy, these Greeks want to see Jesus. I wonder what the master will say if I told him that these Greeks want to see him. Some Bible commentators surmise that Philip may have gone to Andrew because Andrew was the brother of Peter. And Peter was considered to be the lead disciple, right? I'm not sure about that explanation though. Here's what I think, and there are many contextual theologians that agree with me. Philip was unsure so he went to Andrew because Andrew was the only other 
disciple with a Greek name. We don't know why Andrew's parents gave him a Greek name while they gave his brother the name Simon, a translation of Kepha, or more commonly known as Cephas, which derives from Aramaic. Now let me not get lost in translation, as they say. The bottom line is that all the disciples had names derived from Aramaic, except these two, Philip and Andrew. So they were the ones that were approached by the Greeks. At the time, since they mostly conversed in Aramaic, some say, the others would have been called by their Aramaic names, but not Philip and Andrew. And those visiting Greeks would have picked that up. So what's the big deal, you might ask? What's in a name? We have learned over time that we need to find a way to provide entree for people to identify with the gospel. We need to find a way for people to access Jesus in everyday, in everyday life and in everyday language. It has been a practice throughout all of church history. Paul goes to what we know as Mars Hill to speak to the religious leaders at their temple in Athens, which is in Greece. As he wanders through the display of various idols and so-called God statues, he finds an empty spot labeled to the unknown God. This unknown God is Jesus that I proclaim, he said to them. This unknown God that you have left a vacant spot for is the very Jesus that I proclaim to the world. He explains to the Greeks, he is the true God the creator of all things. That's from the book of Acts. And in another text from the book of Acts, the Acts of the Apostles, the other well-known Philip, no connection to this one, the one who was a deacon like Stephen who was stoned, remember that, the, the selection of the deacons. This Philip, was sent to speak to the Ethiopian eunuch. Then the, then the Ethiopian, who had known already the Old Testament scriptures, was taught about Jesus. He in turn went and told the other Africans so that the gospel was spread to the rest of Africa. Yes, in the first century. To this day, African Christianity looks for ways to connect people to Jesus through African culture. I spoke about how John's Gospel did the same in connecting the Gospel to Greco-Roman culture and, and the Greco-Roman world so that they would know this Jesus through something they could identify with. I don't want to spend any time talking about the fact that, in spite of all that I said, God can use whomever and whatever God wants to use to take the gospel to whomever God wants to. That's a given. The question for us today is not a theoretical one. It is a practical one. My question to you, who can you influence in your world? What do you have some, uh, who do you have some commonality with? Who do you have any relationship with? All of those three things, influence, commonality, and relationship. 
How can you use those to bring the gospel to the people you know in your world? I think Philip knew why the Greeks came to him. That is why he went to Andrew. We have all kinds of connections in our daily lives, not just nationality, origin, heritage, or race. Today we live in a cosmopolitan culture, a global village, as some say. So we all can have connections with others. We can find connections with others, even with simple connections, everyday connections like where we shop, where we go to the gym or work out, where we go for walks, which book clubs we are part of, which library we frequent, which doctor's office, which coffee shop, which restaurant we frequent. All of that is a point of contact. Just bring them to Jesus, either by telling them about your faith or what church you go to. Depending on your comfort level, have some conversation that in some way connects them to your identity as a Christian or your Christian life. We all can do that. That's introducing them to Jesus. Then, as in the text today, Jesus will, in his own way, let them hear the gospel. They may not like it all the time, or they might love it. Interestingly, the passage from, from Jesus, uh, the message from Jesus in the text today seems quite harsh. Those who love their life will lose it. And those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me. I wonder if they followed, but that's not for us. Even as it was not on Philip or Andrew, it's, it's up to God. It's not up to us. So many people get to know Jesus from a word or two they hear from a friend, from a relative, or even a stranger that they meet by chance. Politicians may have different reasons to mention Bible texts, and we know why they do. But you and I can have and actually should have intentional ways to introduce people to Jesus in ways and in places that they connect with us. Let's sow the seeds this spring and let God bring those seeds to the harvest when the time is ripe. We just need to be simple, but innovative, and most of all, intentional about introducing people to Jesus. Amen.
God has made us his people through our baptism into Christ. Living together in that trust and hope, we confess our faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Relying on the promises of God, we pray boldly for the church, the world, and all in need. You watch us through and through and remember our sin no more. Make your church a community of forgiveness throughout the world. Give your people courage to forgive, through them show the world new possibilities. Bless ministries of repentance and reconciliation. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. You promise to write your law on our hearts. Guide citizens throughout the world to shape communities that reflect your mercy, justice, and peace, and give them creativity to work for the welfare of all. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. You sustain us with your bountiful spirit. Restore the joy of all who need to know your presence. Those who are lonely or feel unforgivable. Those who need healing of body and mind. Those who are dying and all who grieve. We pray especially for those on our prayer list this week and those we name in our hearts. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. In the cross of Christ, your name is glorified. We praise you for those who have given us words to worship you. With all those who have died in Christ, bring us into life everlasting. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. We entrust ourselves and all our prayers to you, O faithful God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
us pray. God, our provider, you have not fed us with bread alone, but with words of grace and life. Bless us in these your gifts, which we receive from your bounty, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We pray together as our Lord Jesus Christ taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Some parish announcements for us today. First, we wish those who have birthdays this week a very happy birthday. God bless you. We are grateful for those who have continued to be faithful in worshiping together and also those who serve in Jesus' name to make this all possible. We will continue to meet this way though, even as more and more people receive the vaccines and we get clearer guidance on what is the protocols for worshiping communities. Please continue in prayer as we long for that time when we can meet again. You are what God made you to be, created in Christ Jesus for good works, chosen as holy and beloved, free to serve your neighbor. God bless you that you may be a blessing in the name of the holy and life-giving Trinity. Amen. Go in peace. Share the good news. Thanks be to God.